Welcome to this EU side event focusing on a green mobility and transport system at the service of, of carbon neutral EU local communities. This session is organized by four organizations, CR, ERA, UITP and UIC, all coming together with a common goal to transform the way uh, we move people and goods in Europe. Europe can become the world's first climate neutral continent if its mobility offer is built on a backbone of green public transportation and if a green logistic chain is developed based on a multimodal approach. The event will focus on the steps needed to achieve this and innovations required to transition urban and logistic transport to net zero emissions. We will highlight the critical role of public transportation and rail, focusing on the um, EU objectives uh, contained in the EU Smart and Sustainable Mobility Strategy, and also uh, mentioning the model shift to rail, which is uh, highly important. I invite all participants to uh, raise questions uh, during this session via uh, Slido. Uh, my name is Idris Pagan. I'm a project professor at the European Union Agency for Railways, and I will co-moderate this session with Lucy Anderton. Please, Lucy. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, my name's, uh, as Idris said, uh, Lucy Anderton, um, and I lead on the sustainability agenda at the UIC, which is the International Union of Railways, the worldwide um, uh, professional association for uh, railways. So um, we're now going to go straight to a video, actually. We're going to start with a five-minute video, um, which has been created by the four organisations that are here hosting this event. Um, and you'll hear from some of our leaders who would really like to have been here, um, but are sending this message on their vision for, for um, rail and public transport in Europe um, and how it will transform the European cities. Transport represents one quarter of all European greenhouse gas emissions. For the European Union to become a carbon neutral economy by 2050, the way we move must transform within this decade. Trains account for 10% of mobility, but only 3% of energy in transport and 0.3% of greenhouse gas emissions. As the leading electrical mobility mode, Europe's railways must play an essential role in the decarbonisation of transport. Trains, with other active and public transport, must become a crucial element of city and national transport strategies and policies worldwide. The European Union is committed to boosting the modal share of rail by doubling both freight and high-speed rail traffic by 2030. These ambitious targets require both investment and financial incentivization to change mobility behaviours of today. Rail and public transport have the potential to become the backbone of a seamless, interconnected, sustainable, multimodal transport system and with the support of the young generation at CER, ERA, UIC and UITP, we are convinced that we will succeed in our climate ambition. We are all working together to build a safe, green, resilient and efficient transport system in the EU without frontiers. Let's get on board. Let's go on this ride together. Rail is the only mode of transport on track to deliver Paris-based decarbonisation targets. Let us make rail with FISO 55 part of the solution to reverse climate change. We are entering the decade for action for decarbonation. Rail and public transport must be able to change the paradigm of transport. We must have a model share that will double by 2030. We must apply the UN motto which is avoid, shift, improve. And above all, we must be able to make model shift desirable. Rail should become the backbone of the future multimodal transport system and it will be the favoured mode of transport for a new generation of passengers. The fastest, most cost-efficient way to achieve the goal of carbon neutrality in EU cities by 2030 is to strengthen the role of public transport. It helps spur economic growth, improve public health, 
fight inequality all while providing jobs and supporting livelihoods and combating climate change. The need for investment has never been greater or more urgent as public transport improves our lives in so many ways. It is the shot in the arm for our economies to fully rebound and build us back better in the future. Szanowni Państwo, jest dla mnie dużym zaszczytem przemawiać do Państwa podczas dzisiejszej konferencji COP26. Wszyscy jesteśmy świadomi i doświadczamy negatywnych zmian klimatycznych. Poprawa klimatu wymaga działań na rzecz dekarbonizacji sektora transportu. Jako przewodniczący UIC Światowego Związku Kolei zobowiązałem się współpracować z naszymi członkami w Europie i poza nią, aby zapewnić, że kolej będzie odgrywać ważną rolę w osiąganiu konkretnych celów klimatyczno-środowiskowych. Z założenia kolej jest najbardziej wydajną i najbardziej ekologiczną formą transportu zbiorowego. UIC jest w pełni zaangażowane we wspieranie współpracy multimodalnej i wielosektorowej, aby zapewnić tę pilną zmianę modalną w tej decydującej dekadzie. To nie przypadek, że już obecnie jednym z głównych filarów europejskiej polityki transportowej jest kolej. Jako światowy sektor kolei mamy ambicje i oczekujemy tego samego od naszych politycznych liderów. To jest odważnych decyzji politycznych na poziomie globalnym, krajowym, regionalnym odnośnie wsparcia kolei i uczynienia jej kręgosłupem światowego systemu transportowego. Będzie to z korzyścią dla naszych społeczeństw, gospodarki, klimatu i przyszłych pokoleń. O to dziś do Państwa apeluję. Nie będzie poprawy klimatu bez większego udziału kolei. So it's a great honor to have today with us uh, Miss Anna de Parne Grunenberg, who is a member of the European Parliament, a German member of the European Parliament, and more specifically a member of the TRAN co Committee. So, dear uh, Miss Anna de Parne Grunenberg, how do you see the, the future of, of rail, and more specifically, um, how do you see the European Union achieving the objective of doubling uh, high speed uh, traffic by 2030? Yeah, hello everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, yeah, I'm sure um, there will be no Green Deal without Rail. That's uh, that's a point we all share here on this panel. For me, I uh, see that Rail is not only a climate-friendly mode of transport that must become the backbone of transport by passenger and by freight, but it is also a symbol for our generation and the next generations to come. We want to stay connected. We want to work and travel together. Uh, we want to be aware of the landscapes when we are um, traveling and also to be aware of our impact on climate and environment. So we just have seen the two beautiful uh, examples, uh, the Connecting Europe Express from uh, European Union in this European Year of Wales that crosses 26 countries um, and also the, the, the train that that came to, to COP26. We have seen trains are um, places for fruitful exchanges, for resting between exhaustive, uh, exhaustive actions sometimes, even for rest and for meditating a little bit. And the expansion of the high-speed network will play a role, of course, in the new backbone. But uh, however, uh, rail is much more than just building high-speed network. And that's really important for me. Therefore, I want to give you my insights um, on my green vision for the rail sector, and I will call it from a patchwork to a network. So what we need is to think railways in Europe as a real network, because no, no one travels from station to station, but we are all traveling from place to place or from door to door. What matters is, the, is then the quality and the reliability and speed of the entire journey uh, of the entire transport chain and not only on the part of the journey maybe where we can gain 10 minutes or 50 minutes. We see different type of traffic in Europe, passenger or freight of course, but also regional and long distances, night and day traffic. They all have really different needs 
and they need to be coordinated and optimized in their connectivity. But we have a lot of work to do. In this regard, we agreed under the year of rail to develop a rail connectivity index to measure this network index and not just the gain of time on one connection. What we secondly need um, to see the railways um, as an investment into the future of all of us. Developing railways within the public transport system is an investment into the future of our societies, uh, future of our regions and of course uh, of our people and children. It allows every citizen, every city and every region to be connected when we're doing it well. Inclusion is therefore a key um, and we have always to think about re remote regions. And a strong support of digitalization could provide an example of uh, incremental in uh, inclusion of other modes of transport. So what we must do is invest in projects that benefit the entire network and not uh, just gaining 10 minutes of travel time on the new high speed line if you then lose 30 minutes because connection with other trains or other mode of transport are poor. Uh, we need to finance rail in the intermodal chain. That is real priority for me. And uh, dedicated model shift policies need to be developed. So just have this uh, goal doubling passenger numbers is for me not enough. We need a real model split in favor, uh, a change of model split in favor of rail. And so we have to think beyond borders. Railways connections should not be stopped by regional, national or technical barriers. And cross-border real realities requires cross-border solution, in particularly in terms of funding, legal and institutional responsibility. So the EU has a lot to do to push the member state to take this missing links on the borders really serious and also to provide funding. Um, what we need is one information and booking interface. A lot of travelers by train across the continent know that. We need this different um, uh, booking system of the future because it can reduce barriers to travel. And so we must apply the right criteria. And what are, is the economic, ecological and social sustainability? Um, if railway line can generate only little profit, uh, in a closed, uh, the society lo loses a, a, as a whole. So uh, the less we spend on rail, on finance, the more expensive the climate protection will become. And unfortunately, we see in Germany, we still, till today, invest much more money in road system than in rail. And I hope really, and we're working hard on that, that it will change in future. So um, we therefore must yeah, uh, make accessibility the standard and ensure the possibility to transport also bicycle on all trains. This uh, combination between train and a bicycle has really a good future, we think, and we need uh, strong and clear passenger rights across modes and across all companies. So that would be my points. And uh, I, I think, of course, li like we all, that uh, rail can uh, be the modes that help us to decarbonize mobility. And I'm really happy to be here and to uh, to hear what uh, the next speakers has to say, uh, where we can and how we can reconnect Europe through rails. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, uh, we all will uh, make pressure on our governments uh, in our places to make the rail the backbone of the future. Thank you, Anna. It's really, really great to get that. Um, Pan-European perspective um, and really set the context now for this uh, discussion. And I'm going to go now, if you can hang on there, Anna, because we'll bring you in in the discussion later on as well. So, um, But I'm now going to go to our second speaker, he, who's here uh, in, the, in COP26 with us today, um, Ulla Kempf. Welcome to uh, Glasgow. Um, and I'll, if, uh, if you'll, I'll give you the floor shortly, but if, if I can introduce you to Ulla. She's a Head of Capacity and Resource Management at Espo Bay Cargo International, which is, of course, Swiss Railways. Um, and she's also the speaker for railway operators on railway corridor Rhine Alpine. Um, Ulla, can you tell us a little bit more about the role of freight, particularly in greening our sort of logistics chains? Yeah, very happy to do so. Thank you very much. 
It's been uh, it's an honor to speak here at COP, and it's been emotional days here, I mm. think, for all of us. And um, well, transport has been discussed as well in the past days, and I think it is a common conclusion that we're nowhere near sustainability yet, actually. Mm. Mm. So 10% um, of all emissions are still caused by freight transport, and we are expecting growth, actually, in transport by 30% in the upcoming years. And um, just to, for a comparison, um, for Rail, for example, uses nine times less uh, or emits nine, nine times less CO2 than road. And we still have 75% of all transport still transported by trucks. And um, if you think that further, eight times less air pollution caused by rail and six times less use of energy. And also the energy rail uses is 90% in Central Europe is electric energy. So, and in some countries, even the uh, first ones that have 100% of that just renewable energies. So it's quite an obvious choice rail, right, for transport. And that also shows itself in the Green Deal, which is um, uh, foreseeing the doubling the amount of freight transport by 2030. And it's quite shocking that we're not further yet with an 80% mode of share in Europe. So. Um, we need to do something about it. And there are three, three things we could um, do rather quickly, let's say. Uh, one is create a level playing field. And the second is uh, to make our system more intelligent. And the third is to connect. Um, so to create a level playing field is, um, uh, there are means to do so out there. For example, the emission trading system in Europe. And it's quite astonishing that transport is not yet a part of it, actually creating 10% of the emissions, right? So that would, that would be a quick one, let's say, <laughs> to include transport in that. And um, second would be to foster and boost innovation. Um, we are a low margin business, so we are lacking behind on that, to be honest. Uh, we are sometimes still working the way we did 50 to 100 years ago, even. <laughs> so, but there are great ideas out there, so we can make use of them if we want to. So, for example, there is this um, idea that has come partly to life in Europe of digital capacity management. And um, that is to take a bit in the details of railway. Uh, you still today, if you want to drive a train across Europe, you need to um, plan that manually. The infrastructure managers plan that by hand. Uh, and it takes quite a long time to do so. Uh, so if you can automate that process, you could increase in the speed in intensively. Uh, instead of days actually to con construct a path, you would only need a couple of minutes. So there are first infrastructure managers who have done so, and where we as railways can receive a path on a click, and therefore are a lot more flexible to offer our customers products. But at the same time, it has another value in it, and that is that you can therefore, the first time, um, see the network as a whole, because you have digitalized it. And that's also uh, the, the network idea. I was quite happy that was mentioned before, because um, we then can optimize that network if we have it digitally. And there have been, uh, in the countries where the model has been successfully introduced, we are able to, to um, run up to 4% more trains on the same network without building a single line. So you have, for little money, actually a great value, the speed and the, uh, the amount of trains we can raise. And there are a couple of ideas like that out there, the digital automatic coupling, the European traffic management system, we have a digital platform, and uh, in the end, we also have the vision of running our trains automatically one day. So, so the ideas are there, and we do know how to do it, so we can get going if we want to. But the third thing, in the end, no one can do it alone. Um, and we do need to connect also in order to reap the benefits of each transport mode that we have best, because each has their value and each has their core strengths. And if we can connect them well, we can then create a living ecosystem of transport in Europe with rail as the backbone, because that is the core strength of us, but also using the other modes for the last and first mile in the periphery and everything. So if we do that cleverly, I think it's quite graspable that we can make transport in Europe sustainable very soon. Wow, that sounds like some really exciting things happening yeah. with freight, you know, which, uh, you know, who knew? Who knew? So. <laughs>
That's great. Well, thank you, Ella. Um, we'll come to you again later. First, I'm going to um, launch our first poll, if that's okay. So if we can, we can launch the first poll, I think we'll, we'll get a QR code up um, shortly where we'll, um, we'll ask you to start to interact in, um, in the conversation. So here is the first question, and we'll, we'll give you a bit of time to consider it and answer, the, answer your preferred uh, single question, your single answer. Um, what do you think are the main barriers to achieve European-wide rail network? So do you think it's a lack of rail, attractive rail offer? Uh, infrastructure is perhaps too slow and too costly to build. Uh, is it something around the regulatory framework? Or is it more around the level playing field that we've just been talking about as well? So if you could... Um, Connect in with that QR code, and um, we'll, we'll come back to that poll um, once you've had a chance to answer the questions. And in the meantime, we'll uh, welcome our last speaker. We are delighted to, to have uh, with us today Councillor Dr. Martin Bartosz, who is also the chair of Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, which is a regional transport partnership um, of the Glas Glasgow region. Um, how do you see the connection between rail and, and public transport, and uh, how do you think it helps public transport helps to reach uh, climate neutrality, especially in, in cities li like yours? Well, well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me. I'm very pleased to uh, to be here, and I'm very pleased that you're all here as a uh, as a local politician in Glasgow, I'm, I'm delighted to... I hope you've all had a very um, a positive COP experience. Um, the uh, transport body which I chair, uh, Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, is the largest of the uh, regional transport partnerships in Scotland. And we have a mixture of functions, uh, part uh, strategic and part operational. And rail is, a very, uh, is close to our heart because we run and own the 10 kilometres of the Glasgow subway. Um, I do hope you've had a chance to, to use our wonderful small subway system. Um, it's the third oldest in the world, um, but still running uh, and is 125 years old uh, this year. In fact, we're just in the process of uh, undertaking a significant modernisation programme with it, with indeed some of our rail stock coming from Switzerland. Um, and, uh, and it is probably our uh, best low-carbon piece of transport infrastructure in the west of Scotland. But the question you put to me was, you know, where does rail fit in the wider issue of uh, decarbonisation and sustainability? And this is something that we, like um, every other region have, uh, and every other city, have been trying to wrestle with. How do we achieve a drive towards um, uh, decarbonisation completely for all modes? It is not easy. And I think one of the key things that is that we need to think about, as Ulla was saying, the appropriate use of transport. Um, the, the right transport methods for the right kind of task, as well as a very significant modal shift. In the end, um, our future is going to have to be shared, um, and indeed that's one of the advantages of uh, rail freight, is effectively the aggregation um, uh, advantages associated logistically. Um, the same goes for public transport over private transport. It's the aggregation opportunities of vehicles which means that public transport has a lower carbon footprint. Um, whatever the vehicle, uh, whether or not it's got two wheels or whether or not it's got uh, four, eight, or however many wheels, depending on the mode, um, we do need to make sure that it's affordable in carbon terms. And we need to consider what are the lowest carbon methods of getting people around where they need to go. Um, but crucially, we need to have a future uh, transport-wise which is attractive. Um, if we do not have an attractive transport system, we will not get modal shift. And we've done quite a lot of work uh, thinking about this. And in fact, I'd encourage you to have a look at a paper uh, for Transport for Strathclyde at spt.co.uk forward slash transport for Strathclyde. You'll find there a paper which sets out a vision for um, how we can go about in a region um, focusing on what's necessary. And that really does mean one network. Uh, proper integration. It means a, a, a smart network, which means uh, engaging with the digital opportunities of uh, mobility as a service. In a sense, again, reflecting what's happening on, uh, on rail logistically for freight, except for human beings. Um, we need to have a green network, so we need to understand where the emissions are so that we can target decarbonisation. And actually, the fifth thing that we've identified is we need to have um, a network of the future. We need to be able to embrace future technologies. 
and we need to take a really hard look at what we have with our current modes because all of our modes have their difficulties even dare I say it in this in this uh, illustrious audience, even rail has its difficulties in terms of um, the materials necessary to uh, maintain the wheels, the rolling stock, the rail infrastructure. We need to seriously look at how we um, actively decarbonize all of it, and that means carbon accounting as well as working on these shared attractive carbon affordable systems. Thank you very much, and you pointed out also one uh, concrete example of uh, green competitive advantage of rail. It's also the long life cycle of, of, uh, of uh, this mode of transport. Also, it can impede sometimes innovation, but <laughs> there are always pros and cons in, in advantage. So thank you very much, and, and before discussing the results of poll number one, I would like to launch uh, poll number two. Uh, which is uh, more about uh, freight and uh, it will quickly appear on screen. The question is how could we enhance the role of railway freight in a greener logistic chain with four uh, possible options. So the uh, connectivity, the multimodality, so the connection between the different modes of transport, the technological development, like you mentioned also digital automatic coupling, the level playing field, putting a fair price on CO2 emissions for all modes of transport, and um, increasing the visibility of the rail offer uh, on the market. Now I would like to um, have a look at the, at the results to the first poll, uh, if it's possible, and I would like um, uh, our speakers uh, to react on, on the results. And, and maybe starting with Miss um, um, uh, Anna de Parne Grunenberg, um, what's your view on, on these results, and uh, what would be your vote uh, to, to this uh, to this question? What would be your answer to this question? And maybe do you see other elements that that are impeding um, the European Union to achieve a European-wide railway network? So please, Miss uh, de Parne Grunenberg, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we the the public has it well. Is it is it of course, and we know expensive to build a new infrastructure, and um, I think it's it's a long term project. We but when we see, as I said, how much money is put in the road infrastructure, we should really have a carbon price on it, and uh, uh, each invested uh, euro. Uh, should be should be another one than um, in the in the old mode of transport, I think. And uh, as the previous speaker said, um, we also have to look that we can with digitalization and better network, um, ERTMS and digital coupling and so on, really use the infrastructure in a complete new view, a new way without have to build uh, so much new infrastructure. So I think we have to focus on that and not uh, just on the difficulty that, uh, of course, steel is uh, still um, a material that is uh, expensive uh, regarding to CO2, and we have to be better in that. But we really have to look at the um, existing infrastructure and how we can use it much better. In my home region, in Baden-Württemberg, we are a pilot project for e ERTMS because we have some um, neck holes so, uh, somewhere in, in, in the network, and we see we can increase up to 25% just with digitalization between the trains. So I think that's a, that's a way to deal with it. Thank you very much. I don't know if Ula or Martin would like to also react to this question. Um, yes. Please, then. <laughs> I, I can fully agree with what has been said. And it's also the example I gave um, that we can do uh, what, what, use what we have a lot smarter. And that is, um, for example, also if you see uh, we do maintain infrastructure mainly at night and um, each country then closes their network at night and that means that if a train run that takes 24 hours will run into dead zones in each country again and again. So if we think Europe as a network and think in transport streams and then optimize those, we still have some capacity left on our networks to further use before we need to build one. We still need to build, it's an obvious, I mean, this amount of growth, no one can optimize on the networks existing. We're not that inefficient, but, <laughs> but, but we do have so, some left, and that is especially 
taking the European perspective and optimizing these complex networks from the European, pers European perspective, but we do need digitalization for it. Mm -hmm. And if we combine all the technologies I mentioned, we also estimate that we have another 30% of growth possibility on rail, so that's quite extensive. Mm. And we should make use of that, because it's quickly established and also a lot cheaper. <laughs> I suppose, once again, there, there is this question of how much time we have, in fact, for decarbonisation. Yes. And, and we, we need to face the fact that different forms of infrastructure do take different amounts of time to build and have different payback periods. And I completely agree with Ulla, we need to maximise the use of the, um, the, the long-lasting uh, the long-lasting assets that we have, such as rail. Um, but alongside that, there are very complicated and very difficult decisions in terms of weighing up which infrastructure we have the carbon budget to afford. And, and this is difficult, and I think actually the, the poll uh, very much represented it from the participants that, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of the, the next poll results that I've seen sight of, which, which <laughs> relates to the question of carbon cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, indeed, we, if we'll crack on then to that next poll. First, we're going to launch poll number three so that you'll have time um, to consider poll number three. So if we could get poll three question up. And so this is all about the future of zero emission mobility in our cities. Um, and so what, you know, what, what is that future? Is it about combining active modes? Is that the most uh, significant transformation? Is it about implementing mobility as a service concepts and the digital platforms that come with those? Is it perhaps um, are all around battery electric vehicles? Or is it, um, fourthly, about strengthening the role of urban planning and the connections between those large and small medium cities? Okay, um, so as you can see there, we will, I'm going to come to you first, Ula, uh, um, and while we have a look at the results of poll number two, if that's okay. <laughs> Okay, so we can see there's quite a, a strong um, leader here in the, in the response to this question that really pricing CO2, it really we see as a, oh, it's still moving, how exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, still, it's still clear that half of us, more than half of us indeed, think that uh, carbon um, is the most important side of things. So I don't know, what, what do you think of that, uh, Ulla? Well, I... I'm quite happy with this result. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, obviously, it's not one or the other, but all of it. Mm. But um, it is something we have been missing out on as a, as a fair booster for freight uh, in the right direction. And also to create this, uh, this enabler in order to get each mode into that transport where it's suited best, right? To, to get the long haul on the most energy efficient transport modes and the short haul on the quick flexible ones. So it is a crucial step we need to take and we can take it now and we should take it now. Thank you. Martin, I don't know if you want to, uh, uh, not really your space, I guess, for eight, but... Um. Well, in actual fact, the Transport Authority does have strategic responsibilities uh, around all transport strategy, not just uh, public transport, but freight transport as well. Um, but absolutely, if, if the point of this meeting in, in Glasgow is around trying to give us a chance of saving the planet, as, you know, shorthand for uh, containing climate change, um, then we need to be serious about carbon. So actually, that's a really positive uh, comment that all of our participants know that we need to be serious about carbon. Then we need to cost it, uh, cost it properly and take actions which reflect that. Yeah. Anna, um, if you, I don't know if you'd like to build on some of those comments. Yes. Um, so I actually thought I missed one, and I want to add it now. Yeah. Uh, what I what I saw what is really working is when you are doing the classical push and pull. So, uh, for instance, charging the heavy duty vehicles uh, on the road and taking the money to earmark that that we call that in politics and to put the money in sustainable mode of transport. And so the first um, response to invest in the rail sector, in the digital uh, stuff we, we, we just spoke about, um, that's something that works really fast. So of course, putting a CO2 price is really important and we have to do that. 
But if you look to Switzerland, we've, uh, they began in the early 90s to yes. um, account the external cost of road transport regarding the actual level of uh, freight transport. And they charge really per ton and per kilometer each uh, differences on road. And they put this money nearby one to one in the transport. And we see in Switzerland, they have a, a rail freight uh, model by near 40%. In the EU, we are by 18. So that could be a, a really, uh, yeah, a really fast answer. But we don't have the political um, majorities now to do it, but I'm working on. <laughs> Yeah, Swiss is a very good example, and maybe now we can move to uh, the results to the third poll, so we can we can discuss um, the future of mobility in the cities. I see that um, a lot of people believe that it's a combination between micro mobility or active modes of transport with public transport. What's your reaction, Martin, on on this uh, topic? Uh, how would you have voted? I. I would have voted for all of them. <laughs> Actually, none of them can be excluded. No. Um, and in fact, if we if if we think about each of the each of the options, it's absolutely the case that we need uh, people to, for for health reasons, um, as well as sustainability reasons, um, be engaging more in active travel. Mm -hmm. And that inevitably connects us with planning issues to do with how our uh, cities are constructed. Um, how the services, how the facilities are arranged to them to try and uh, take a kind of place-based approach to planning. And that's vital. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Glasgow, I, I mentioned the forward thinking in Glasgow about the subway. Unfortunately, in the 1950s and 60s, the forward thinking into the 70s was that the future was going to be the car. And unfortunately, we ended up having motorways cutting through the city and, and becoming a car-friendly city. Mm. We need to rethink these kinds of things, and we, that requires a completely different approach to planning. I, I, as for the other elements, I actually think that the digital uh, element, the kind of smart network element, is crucial for getting people to do modal shift. Um, there are a group of people who use in, in Glasgow and around uh, the, the region who use public transport because they have no other alternative. Um, but there's a great many people who are affluent enough to have an alternative, but we need them to shift also. Public transport needs to be suitable for everybody because we cannot globally afford for people to be using private carbon intensive transport. Um, so all of the above really, uh, as, as quickly as uh, we can <laughs> possibly make it happen. I don't know if, Anna, would you like to react also on the um, interaction of rail and public transport in cities and future of mobility in the cities? Mm, yes, I, as I was local council in Stuttgart and uh, we have the same story mm. apparently that Glasgow, we, have, we planned everything on and around the car. Uh, we are uh, learning a lot how to do it in another way and we are learning how much uh, braking uh, power we also have in our cities. So um, I think we, we have to make it affordable um, at the beginning, for 10 years, as I was a local council, even the Green said, but a mobility has a value. So it's not okay to make it so cheap because you have the resources and so on. Uh, but slowly we really noticed that uh, lowering the price and making it um, a collective investment, because it's, it's not for free, of course, we have to pay it as a society, really uh, low down the barrier. And we are thinking about some uh, push and pull actions. So we are now trying to make a pilot project that everybody uh, using the infrastructure in our town has to pay a mobility card. So even the car drivers. And when you have the mobility card, you can drive by car. It's your car, but you can also jump for free uh, with the card. We have to. You have to pay it in uh, in the public transport. And so that would be enormous more money for the system to make it better all the bike lines and so on. And we are sure that people, when you have to pay for it, so you can decide every day if you let your car or if you if you jump on the public transport. And I think we have to be really creative to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to make a good transport affordable for everyone. Zula, I know it's not your main topic, professional topic, but if I remember well, you are also an 
intense bike user, so I'm sure you have an opinion on that. Well, well. that <laughs> and uh, um, I'm living in Switzerland, and the biggest boost there was achieved by introducing the clock face timetable mm. in 2000. And that just made traveling by public transport so easy. It is never the car you choose because it will be more of a hassle to go to where you want to go. So it's really well connected. You just go to the train station. You basically don't have to check. There will always be a train running. You then go to another station and the connection will be there. It's all connected. You can then take the car for the periphery because it's also there as a sharing option and even bikes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it, so the, the value of it is that it's connected and it's, that it's moving as one, even though there are different players in that. And the, the whole, you can buy a ticket for the country, basically, and just use everything there is, the ferries. The, the, so it is quite tricky to go to Europe and you forget that you need to buy something at every company. <laughs> but so it's just so easy. And with the easiness also comes the comfort. And with that, you're also willing to pay a bit more, actually. Yes, indeed. Hmm. Okay, well, that's our three polls. I think it's been really interesting to sort of have that uh, input from everybody in the audience. So thank you for engaging everyone in that. Um, and so we've got plenty of time now, indeed, for more interaction. Um, we're going to do some question and answers. So I think we can, um, we can open up for this um, Q&A. Um, have we received any questions in yet um, digitally, Sarah? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll see those coming up on screen. Thank you. Ah, yes. The political impact of uh, having green and CO2 taxation, uh, it, it developed some protests in France leading to the yellow jacket and some, and we had also in France the blue, uh, the red uh, helmet uh, with, uh, with the CO2 taxation of trucks. Um, I know we protest a lot in France, but uh, <laughs> it's true that this has to be accompanied also to to make people uh, more able to use public transport. Uh, that it's not it's still attractive from a cost point of view. Uh, what's what's your view on on this? How what what could be the measures to help and to make sure that we don't exclude by this new taxation? I I think. Um well, it's, it's right to ask a politician about how, <laughs> how to make taxation popular. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I think a little bit about my uh, past history before politics when I was uh, a practicing doctor. And uh, as a psychiatrist, I found myself quite often having conversations with people who did not want uh, to follow my best advice. Um, <laughs> And one part of that is a, is a very careful negotiation and also a clarity that there is respect as well as um, opportunity from pursuing the advice. And I think that that kind of social contract is necessary in terms of public transport. Um, one of the things that we've been contemplating here is, is uh, and in that paper which I mentioned before, um, was the idea that yes, we do need more resources coming into public transport. If local government, which is broke in Scotland, you know, can't afford it, if central government is nursing the, the impacts of COVID, how do we get more money into, um, into transport when we know that actually more and better public transport saves the public money? And the answer may well be to start thinking of public transport almost like our water system. So in this country, um, every household has on their, on their local taxation uh, bill a small line which nobody looks at, which is the water charge. Um, and, and people don't begrudge it because they know that they get for that to be plumbed into a water system and they get clean water when they need it. And actually, it may well be the case that the future, uh, you know, the future of um, taxation which uh, raises money for transport is to make very clear the step change difference which is achieved by that money. So if, if I had the power to do it, and of course all politics is, is about uh, finding the collections of the relevant uh, politicians and, and persuading them, but if I had the power to do it then what I would be doing is I would be giving every citizen within my region a transport card which was these days basically a transport app 
And in exchange for giving a transport uh, app, I would give them transport credits so that they had a basic transport allowance, so that they knew that they were clearly getting something of value. And it would only be then when I was giving them a transport guarantee saying, I will commit as a transport authority to arrange that you can get from your home to your place of work or your study or, or hospital health care for a transport credit. It would only be after I had said, this is what I promise you, that I would then show the bill. Um, because there has to be a kind of combination of the two. And it does require the cooperation of national government, local government, and the kind of goodwill and, and, and work with um, you know, private operators. There needs to be a coming together. But we need to find these kind of creative solutions so that people understand the value um, of public transport. Because they won't, resist, uh, they won't resist contributing money if they know that it's a useful investment. They'll resist if they don't know where it's going, nothing's been promised, and all the politicians are doing is making it worse for them. <laughs> I'm sure maybe also Anna would like to react uh, to, this, uh, to this topic. Microphone. Yes, I can try. Um, also, just to, to, to jump on what has been said. Um, that's really important that you can also explain to people uh, which one for any reason to, to stay by driving their car, maybe handcraft or so on, that if they invest in the system and a lot of people in the, uh, in the city will take uh, the public transport and the roads are more or less near to empty, it's really a benefit for everybody. So you can also get the people they don't uh, want maybe to, or they cannot take the public transport with the idea that we have to pay collectively for it. And that's a benefit for everybody. Uh, it's a social question about uh, air pollution and it's, uh, it's really changing our, our, our mind on, on how city is working together. And at, at a more um, national level, if we, if we think to the Gilets Jaunes, of course, uh, we have to pay back the money in a way. We cannot just um, tax uh, the CO2 and uh, let the, the poorest of our population, uh, uh, yeah, led, led with this lack of, uh, of income they need. So we have to create systems to, to give it back so that you are a kind of, if you are using uh, average CO2 manner your daily life, you are at zero. If you are really a polluter, you you get less and if you're really um ecological in your way of doing you're going to have this money back and to be to have more at the end of the year so that that we are planning in germany about the co2 taxation on not on transport for instance now but on energy so that we want the burger gel uh the mm -hmm. citizen money back to the to the people uh so they can uh, so that that's a system functioning also for uh, for everybody. That, uh, that's an idea we have to take care of um, really each and uh, each matter we are doing. Because if we are not doing it um, sustainably on the social way, we are not going to be uh, on track to, 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 to transform our system towards de decarbonized society, I'm sure. Okay. Next question. Okay. Um, well, uh, perhaps Anna will stick with you for a minute because I think there was a question there um, that's come in um, uh, the, asking how we get railways higher up, um, increasing the position of railways on the political agenda. I don't know if you want to comment on that before we come back to those in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen the question <laughs> already. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, we try it, uh, of course, with the uh, European Year of Rail to pu put it really high on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think every citizen can uh, participate to a lot of uh, a platform uh, on climate change. We have this um, future of European Union and we have a lot of platform and just speak about transport, uh, write uh, about what you need in rail system that helps a lot uh, the political discourse to be better. And what is really important to, to fix in the next years is this uh, level playing field. It's uh, called a little bit boring, but it's really important when you see that the road uh, the road is not taxed in, in Europe, but uh, every train has to pay uh, access charge for each kilometers. When you see that there is no uh, kerosene tax on, on planes, and when you see that there is no international VAT for planes, that's really unfair. So we have, of course, 
uh, the first step to change the system to make a, at, at least a level playing field um, would be better to uh, to to discriminate positively the rail, I would say. But at least we have to make this a level playing field. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of occasion to to put this uh, this voice for, forward towards our national governments, the local politicians, and also the EU. Thank you, Anna. Okay, I don't know if you guys would like to uh, build on that in terms of how we sort of really raise the rail railways so it's spoken at higher levels and in, in events like COP and making sure that it's uh, higher on the agenda in, in international discourse. Go ahead. But I think it has been quite a good couple of years for railways already because we feel higher on the political agenda than ever. Mm. And um, I think the more awareness we have in our daily lives uh, in about climate friendliness, let's say, the more aware it will become eventually. And what I, for example, liked really a lot at COP here, when you bought your salad or food, you had a, not only, usually you have a nutrition score, but here you have a CO2 score. Mm -hmm. And that just makes you so much more aware of what you do in your daily life. And by that, we can also raise awareness, because then you start thinking about how, how, why is that a better CO2 score? And how did that get here in the store? And maybe how can I influence also with my buying decision on how we change uh, our way of living and transporting? And, and so it's a two-way street there, right? So um, I think political awareness is good due to the, for rail, it can be better, obviously. Um, it's more about talking about solutions now than, than like how do we get rail where we need it. Um, and that, put that on the political agenda, <laughs> that will be very prosperous. But at the same time, educating ourselves on what, how, how we live and how that affects our lives and how we can change from there on. I think um, every, every region has its uh, differences and um, the relationship between rail and other uh, transport modes in Scotland and in this region is quite complicated. Um, there is a, f a fairly substantial amount of subsidy and investment which goes into uh, rail as a public transport infrastructure in, in Scotland to the extent that uh, there's much more there than there is for bus services um, in, in this area. Um, that's not to say, of course, that rail isn't absolutely vital to invest in, and there's a great deal of work which needs to be done in terms of decarbonisation, and, and a lot of that is now, is now being planned. Um, but I suppose since I, since I chair a, a kind of a transport authority rather than a rail authority, even though I'm very fond of the rail system that we have, um, there is that real balancing need to look at, uh, at what's implied with different, uh, with different modalities. Um, and I think that we need to keep alive to the specifics within each area. Do you have time for last question? I think um, we do. <laughs> Maybe night trains? Yeah, okay. You have not mentioned night trains, so I don't know. I, I, I know some of you guys are really into night trains, so maybe do you see a future for night trains? We see that it's a trending topic. Do you think that economically it will be possible to launch and revital revitalize this, this kind of services? And maybe we can start with Anna? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Yeah, it was just thinking, oh, I hope the last question, I would place it. I had it here on my paper, speaking about night trains. <laughs> yeah, of course. We see, um, as uh, Ulla said at the beginning, we are not so good in using the infrastructure on 24 hours a day we have. And there is a period in the night where we can share the infrastructure with freight, um, and if you're taking care of noise, it would be r really good for, for all the topics we, we have to deal with, uh, decarbonization and uh, respecting environment and so on. And we want the young people to have a future that they, they of course, want to meet themselves and to, to be connected all over Europe. We cannot just say, oh, traveling by plane is so bad. We have to deliver some real alternatives. And uh, we see that there is a real re renaissance of NATE train and each new connection um, as is, is coming is just booked over. You cannot jump in anymore if you're not really, really um, fast. So we see that uh, the younger generation and also uh, business people want to take the night trains to, um, to travel all over Europe. We, we see that each travel can be just one hour because you arrive half an hour, you prepare yourself to bed, 
uh, after that you sleep so you don't see the, and you don't feel the time and you have one half an hour to get ready in the and you are in the in the middle of the town you want to get there and not somewhere outside uh, with difficult traveling with uh, with shuttle from the airplane and so on so that's a really good mode of transport but we have uh, yeah some some difficulty to put it to we don't have enough rolling stock uh, the the crossover the um, the borders is not so easy and also as I said the level playing field is not really easy for such companies uh, to to turn over economically so we have to work on that and now we see a lot of uh, rail company jumping in we're pushing for that also in Germany and uh, we hope that the night train network is really come as a new mode of transport it has to be really connected with uh, the other uh, transport modes and you have to have a whole night so it's not an easy system you have to uh, to have a look on which time you are departing which time you're arriving so that is a real night but i think we can afford in the next uh, decade to have good night trains connection between all capitals of Europe and between all big cities in Europe that w would be tremendous as an alternative to, to show on uh, middle hall flights. Okay, thank you. And here we have the Caledonian sleeper uh, between... Yes, the it's a <laughs> wonderful one. <laughs> I, I, I'm a massive, massive fan of sleeper trains. Um, a number of years ago, uh, a friend of mine um, had uh, a baptism for his daughter in a small town just outside Berlin. And in those days, I had taken myself off all flying. Um, um, I managed that for about eight years or something. And uh, the only way practically for me to get from Glasgow to a small town outside Berlin within the short holidays that I had as a doctor was to jump on the sleeper train to London, take the Eurostar to Brussels, jump on a sleeper train to Berlin, uh, and then take the local train. It was, it was a fascinating experience um, seeing the different um, standards of uh, trains and the different experience, but we need to be offering realistic options. The big problem, of course, then comes to be affordability, because if you compare the, the, the trains overnight, uh, or indeed the trains during the day in the UK, uh, versus the similar costs of short-haul flights, mm. people looked at me as, as, I, as if I was mad. Mm. Mm. Time for conclusion. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that's really, really interesting. Thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. Um, we're now going to just, just a last sentence, just to close up, if that's all right. Uh, Ulo, how would, how would you like to sort of conclude today? Well, I think the right questions have been raised here and also the right uh, initiatives are being discussed in order to reach our goals. And coming, uh, living in a country that has a 75% market share in rail, I'm quite convinced that we can make it happen. Thank you. Uh, I think it has to be a shared system, it has to be a smart system, and it has to be carbon affordable. And uh, rail is clearly a significant and important part of that mix. Um, and to Anna? Yeah, I think that rail is back on the political agenda. That's fine. I hope the year of rail has contributed to this. And uh, we have concrete steps, the steps now to follow. For instance, I'm hoping that the plan that is coming now from the uh, Commission on December, uh, the action plan on long distance passenger rail, I hope I will work on that and I hope I will find better ticketing in it, high ambition on freight and of course the night train networks. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of our speakers. Thank for you. Yeah. Brilliant. And if you could all perhaps give them a round of applause. Yes. That was great. Thank you very much for... Thank you. It was a really interesting session and I think... Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, it was...